Kia ora koutou. So I'd just like you to take a minute to think of a time when you've sprained a muscle or torn a muscle um, anywhere in your body. So it could have been in your arm or in your leg. So just take a time to think back. I'm sure you know, some of you have sprained something at some point in your life. And I'd just like you to think about what you did when you sprained or you tore that muscle. So did you take time out? Did you rest it? Did you put ice on it, try and lift it up? Or did you have to keep going? Did you have to keep walking? Did you have to keep putting pressure on it? So what we know is that if we rest up, it speeds up recovery. So if we are resting it and putting ice on it, um, doing all the things that people tell us to do, that speeds up recovery. We also know that's not the reality. We can't always do that. So um, there's the evidence saying that it speeds up recovery. The same is exactly true of the brain. So the brain isn't a muscle, it's a tissue, but it's exactly the same thing that when we injure the brain in any kind of way, it needs time to heal and repair itself. The trouble is the brain is our control centre to everything that we do. You know, everything we think, everything we see, everything we hear, everything we want our bodies to do. It's the central part. And so it has to keep carrying on when there's been an injury. And so what happens after an injury is um, the brain has to spend time repairing itself. But the trouble is because we need the brain to do anything in our everyday lives, it doesn't have that time to rest up and give itself time to repair and recover. So it has to repair itself in addition to building all these new connections that it has to on an everyday basis as we learn new information, we're processing new skills, or we're getting better at something. So it's almost having to multitask after it's had an injury. So this makes it harder to do even the simplest of things. And um, anyone who's had a brain injury will understand the frustration when you're just trying to do something really simple. It can be really, really hard work. And that's because the brain's having to do almost twice as much work to do something really simple. <laughs> and this is, they're now showing evidence of this. And the hardest things when you're talking about brain injuries, it's, there's nothing to see. It's, it's all sort of away in the brain. But with scans now, they're showing that if you put someone in a scanner and you ask them to do a simple task, like add one plus five, for example, or one plus one, someone without a concussion will show a picture like this. So you can see there's only a few areas of red and a few areas of yellow. Yellow means there's a lot of activity going on. Red means there's something going on. And then when it's, there's nothing there like this, it means there's not a lot going on. Okay? When you get someone who's had a, a mild injury, like a concussion, which is a mild brain injury, you see all these other areas of the brain coming into play because the brain's having to utilise other bits of the brain to make new connections so it can still do the things it needs to do using other parts of the brain that aren't injured. Okay? So you see this much bigger picture of activity going on, even for a very simple task. So that's why people really struggle to process information, particularly after a brain injury, um, but also why it's so fatiguing. And when I'm talking about fatigue, I'm talking not just about tiredness, I'm talking about extreme tiredness, that tiredness where you feel like you've got the flu and you just can't even think about getting to the kitchen to make a cup of tea. It's just too hard. And that's the reason why, because everything the brain is doing, it's working twice as hard. Things like multitasking, the brain's already multitasking. So if you're trying to do two more things on top of that, it can be really, really overwhelming for the brain. It's also um, one of those things where, you know, things are happening in everyday life and it can become really stressful. And having to cope with stress while you're trying to do things also, people find really difficult. Again, because of the pressure and the demand that that's putting on the brain. Now, one of the things I've I've sort of made my, my life passion is around this term mild brain injury. It's a complete, complete misnomer. <laughs> um, and a study that we've recently done that um, Elisa mentioned is, was down in the Waikato. And for a one year period, we actually um, tried to find everybody who had had any kind of brain injury over a one year period. And we followed those people up to see how they were doing over the year for their recovery. And what I did was to look at those who just had a so-called mild brain injury um, to see how they were doing. Now what you can see here 
when people normally think of a mild brain injury, they think it's going to take a few days, a couple of weeks, and then you'll be back to normal. What we're seeing here finally is some evidence that nearly half of the people that we saw who had had a so-called mild brain injury were really struggling with fatigue and sleep problems one year later. So it's not something that automatically gets better naturally quickly. It is something that's taking time. And unfortunately, fatigue and sleep isn't necessarily something that services um, really look at enough, I don't think, um, when they're offering treatment, and that's if you get treatment. So when you look, I mean, people often talk about the fact, well, yeah, I have sleep problems. You know, I really struggle with fatigue. But actually, when you compare it, it's far, far greater after you've had a brain injury. The other thing that I uh, was also pleased that came out, because it's something that when you talk to people about their experience, you know, when you talk to people about recovery, you expect this beautiful journey of everything getting better. Anyone who's been through it, up and down, and up and down, left and right, up and down. <laughs> um, you know, it's not stable. And often it can be really, really difficult when you're in those down bits, if you're expecting it to be this beautiful natural trajectory. So finally, we've got some evidence to say, look, this is a normal thing that happens. It is going to go up and down. And when you're in those down parts, hang in there because it is going to get better. Yeah. So what this is saying is that the brain is still recovering even a long time, even one year later after a mild brain injury. So when you think how this might translate to moderate and severe, you know, it's really starting to paint a picture that you know, this is something that people have told me that they're struggling with, and finally we have some evidence for so when you think about sleep, and why I'm so passionate about sleep, is sleep is fundamental to our survival. You know, uh, the study has shown that unless we get four hours sleep a night, we can die. You know, a body needs sleep. It's an important function um, for both health and recovery. And um, in studies they used to do of torture treatment, sleep deprivation was actually a form of torture because it's so fundamental to everything. So people sort of started hallucinating and losing control of their bodies and things like that. It also re reduces the immune system if you're not getting enough sleep. People's feeling of well-being, um, everything becomes harder, but also there's an increased risk of accidents. So things like driving and making mistakes, dropping things, those sorts of things. So sleep is really, really crucial. And I don't think it's something that in the whole um, population we talk enough about. It also affects a number of other symptoms that you can have after a brain injury. So it's related to how we think, it's related to how we feel, to our mood, how we talk to people, how we can process information. So that's why I'm so passionate about sleep. And one thing that I find really interesting when I was first starting out was this um, notion of how things have changed over time. So before the invention of electricity, the average number of hours people were asleep was 10 hours. How many people here managed to get 10 hours? It's n on average now, it's a lot, lot less. It's about two to three hours less. Um, so it's, there's l much less priority now placed on getting a good night's sleep because we've got all of these other pressures going on in life. Sleep is sort of seen a bit of an inconvenience. <coughs> it's sort of a lesser priority in people's <coughs> lives now, and I think that's something that needs to shift. The only thing to be aware of is, um, when I'm talking about number of hours of sleep, is that can be completely different for very different people. So if you're trying to understand what you need, it may be very different to what somebody else needs. So, um, you know, in the UK we had Margaret Thatcher who only needed four hours of sleep famously, and she worked really well on that. That's all she needed. Other people need 10 hours, others need 11, others need eight. So it's working out what you need and allowing yourself to have that. Now, I'll come back to how you find out what you need in a little bit. If you don't get the sleep that your body needs, unfortunately, we can't fight it. We can't change the physiology of our bodies. If our body needs so much, that's what it needs. And what happens is if it doesn't get the sleep it needs, we accrue a sleep debt almost. So teenagers are a great example of this, how they'll go out hard in the week. And then weekends, you probably won't see them until 3 in the afternoon because they're trying to read coop all of the street, sleep that they've missed out on in, during the week. So, um, as Elise was saying, one of the things we're really keen um, to do is, is to learn from other people's stories. And I've um, been really privileged to talk to a number of um, families where 
over a number of years. So from that study we did in Hamilton and Waikato, we had um, a number of families who we've followed through now to four years after their injury. And I've got some beautiful quotes from them because they can put ideas across far better than I can because they've been through this journey. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what they've been saying um, in the first two years. We haven't finished um, going through the four-year analysis yet. But the key thing was the fact that this was a real journey of discovery for them after they had a brain injury. So one of the things that um, didn't really surprise me, sadly, um, was the fact that there's so little information out there. Um, I, um, you know, in the general population, you know, as I said, we, we don't prioritise sleep enough. And after brain injury, the fact there's all these additional pressures, it, we know we need to be focusing on it far more than we do. And certainly clinicians um, need to be picking up on this. And there's this huge uncertainty about how long is this going to go on for? You know, is this a short-term thing? Is it going to last a long time? Um, and if you try and Google, I don't know if anyone's been on the internet to try and find out about sleep and brain injury, there's very, very little out there. And all this... Yeah, unfortunately, with the sleep studies that they do, excuse me, <coughs> um, people who have any kind of injury or illness are excluded from those studies. So it's a real shame that we can't then say, well, you know, what do we do after a brain injury? I mean, the brain knows what it needs, and it's got a great way of telling you. <laughs> if, but it's very hard initially to, to read those signs and to, to almost allow yourself to accept the fact that you need to have a sleep as well, because it's really frustrating. You're trying to get back into life, and you're trying to do your job, and you're trying to you know, um, spend time with your family and quality time with your kids, and it's hard to do all of that mm. when um, you've had a brain injury. And it's, it's a real battle. Um, sort of saying, you know, if I'm going to get the best out of this, I actually do just need to take some time because in the end that is going to make a difference. So, okay, so these are the stages of sleep that you get. Um, and this cycle actually takes about 90 minutes to go through. So you'll have four or five sleep cycles a night. Okay, so initially this, this first stage, you might not even think you're asleep. You know, it's that kind of, you shut your eyes, you're not, you know, someone sort of talks to you, you're still kind of able to respond. Um, uh, even deeper, that should say. <laughs> um, so in the stage two sleep, that's when you really feel like you've been to sleep, okay? It's a light stage of sleep. It's a transitional phase. So the body's starting to shut down um, certain systems to allow you to go into this very, very deep sleep. So your breathing will become slower. Your body will actually start to cool itself because cooler rooms actually facilitate sleep. So it will naturally cool itself. Um, so a number of these processes are going on in this sleep. Okay? You'll then go into a really deep sleep. And this is where the body actually, it's thought the body restores and repairs itself. Now this is a stage that they have actually got some evidence to show is often disrupted in people who have had a brain injury. So um, what they're suggesting now is um, looking at ways we can increase this. Um, to help people with their recovery. There's then the REM, what they call REM, which is rapid eye movement sleep. And this is where you dream. Okay? So sometimes if you sort of wake up shortly after you've had a REM phase, you'll remember your dreams. Okay? And that's where they, they think that it's all about how you're processed. It's the brain processing the events of that day to build those new connections. And so you'll go through these phases. You might then go back there. You can then go there to there. Don't necessarily happen in the same order. Okay, so you'll go through this four, times, four or five times during the night. Now, what can often happen after a brain injury is it's hard to fall asleep here, particularly if you're worried about what things, you're room, what they call ruminating, so you're going over and over and over something. Um, that can make it really difficult to fall asleep here. As I mentioned, you can also wake up here. What can happen is... If, if someone's experienced an injury and then you have those few weeks where you need to sleep a lot, mm. yeah? So that can often <laughs> change someone's sleep pattern that they've had for years before they've had their brain injury. Um, there's also potentially if the injury to the brain is in one of the areas that is important for sleep, so the brain releases chemicals, for example, that help induce sleep, then that can also affect sleep. So there's, there's so many different things that can cause problems with sleep. So what needs to ha the best way of looking at it is to then understand what that person needs so you can help them get back into a normal sleep cycle again. Because people can often become awake at night and then sleep during the day. Mm. 
Because if they've slept a lot during the day, it's really hard to go to sleep at night because the body doesn't need any more. They're not. It's just their body has become so confused, it's not reading the signals that you sleep at night and you're awake during the day. That all gets thrown into chaos. So is it better to sleep too long? Yes. Yes. And that's why it's really important to spend time trying to work out how much sleep you need. Because sleep's important after brain injury, but trying to manage it in a way that you get enough but not too much that it affects how you sleep at night. That's the key. So what you can do to work it out, because it's different for everyone, which is why, unfortunately, this isn't a simple answer, monitor the sleep over a few weeks. And try and find a time where there's nothing, you know, no major events going on or anything like that where they have to be up late or things. And if you just try and record, you know, have a little column for each day when they're taking a nap and how much sleep they get that night, so you can start to see how much sleep they're needing. Um, you can start to work out, you know, they've had, so they have a two hour nap there, four hour nap there, a two and a two hour nap there. You can then, and then you look at how they sleep at night. So if they rate their sleep quality that night, as you know, it's nine out of 10, then that suggests they might only need two hours nap time. So then you can start setting an alarm to wake them up after that two hour period so they don't oversleep. But it ne you need to take some time to figure out what that person needs because it is different for everybody. And it's, as, as you were saying, it changes. So it's not something this you can do once and think it will keep working because as you get better, the nap times can start decreasing. And you can gradually decrease and decrease, but then you can start focusing on the sleep at night rather than the sleep during the day. One of the hardest things that people find is the fact that, you know, they're several, several years on. And the frustration that this stuff's still happening and people don't expect it to be happening. Just but it's, it's but actually normal. Work. Yes. Yeah, but there are clever ways that you can manage this. So if you know how, what sleep you need, and there's a, um, I've got handouts for all of these quotes that I'll, I'll give you at the end. There's a lovely quote from a couple of people um, who went back to work after their injury who would um, find somewhere they could actually go and take a nap strategically during the day. So we had a guy who went out to the car park and slept in his car. Because he knew if he didn't do that, he wouldn't be able to get anything done that afternoon. And that's how he managed it. Um, we had a truck driver. You know, that's really demanding. You've really got to concentrate. So he would strategically, as much as, you know, he sort of talked to his employer about it, he would strategically pull over to a lay-by and have a nap every 20 minutes. And that enabled him to have the sleep he needed, but to still do his job. So it's about understanding what you need, at what point you are in your recovery. And then there's ways that it can be managed. But it's, particularly if you're caught up in this cycle where you know, you're sleeping in the day, so then it's disrupting your sleep at night, so you feel horrible, so you're sleeping in the day. The sort of the first focus is to get out of that. And then once you sort of start having a routine again, then looking at ways that you can manage it and allow yourself to take the rest that you need. That's the hard part. Yeah. Have people heard about sleep hygiene? It tends to be the thing that gets thrown around and ACC talks about if they talk about sleep at all. Um, the principles of sleep hygiene, as they call it, are, are really useful, but there, there needs to be this other behavioural bit, they call it, to go along with it. So that's making sure that you're in a really dark room. Um, you know, the temptation if you're using your phone <laughs> at night, that's a, a really modern habit that's not really helpful. Uh, watching TV, you know, that's a really stressful activity for the brain. You know, we often think if you sprained an ankle, you know, putting your foot up and watching TV, people think that's resting. Actually, for brain injury, you're straining your brain. Because you're having to process, you're having to follow the storyline, listen to the conversation, process what happened, try and guess what's going to happen. Some people find it relaxing, so if it works for you, great. And this is, you know, if it works for you, stick with it. But it's actually reading a book. All these things we think are resting are actually putting pressure on the brain. So if you're doing this before you go to sleep, your brain often gets to that point where you're too tired to sleep. Do people find they get that, that too tired? And then it's, it seems counterproductive, doesn't it? Some activities actually exhaust you quicker than others and trying to understand and find those and pace them out a little bit can be quite helpful. Or even just changing what you're doing can also be helpful. Um, you know, so if you're you know, mowing the lawn, don't do it in one big bit, do, do half of it, go and do something else, and then you know, have a rest. Or if you, you know, if you don't need a rest, but you're just changing the activity, 
can help to then go back and do it later. That can really help the body to cope, but it's really worth picking out those things that you find really difficult and making sure that you've got time before and after. Don't try and keep going because people do find that they wake up in the morning one day and hopefully you have a few mornings where you wake up and feel great. And the temptation is to go, brilliant, I'm going to go and do everything that I've been wanting to do for days because I felt so rubbish. And then you feel like that a couple of days, for the next few days. Because sometimes people will tell you to go and lie down, but you feel okay at that point. And this is one of the things we find um, really, or people have just said to me that they find really hard, because some, the person's trying to help by saying, you need to go and have a lie down. The person gets really aggravated, because <laughs> you know people find it quite hard to accept that. So um, it was really interesting how um, family was were sort of talking how they had and a bit of an agreement going on. You know, how do you want me to prompt you, you need to go and have a lie down? Because sometimes saying, go and have a lie down, can be quite threatening and immediately, you know, when you think Nick was talking earlier about that sort of aggro part of the brain, mm -hmm. triggers that. So if there's a prompt you can use or something like that, that doesn't mean you're being quite so um, ordering, if that's the word to use. So trying to find something that's not threatening, that's not, you know, attacking the person anyway, or feels like it's attacking, sorry, I keep hitting the mic, um, can be a way to sort of help minimise that sort of agitation. Okay. Um, also, it, there is a lot around this acceptance, you know, for everybody. You know, people don't necessarily understand how important sleep is after an injury. And as hard as it is when there's stuff to be done to allow the person to actually go and take a break, you know, it takes everyone to allow that to happen. Um, the other hard part, and I'm sorry, this is... Uh, I'd love to give you some really easy answers. It is a continuing process, so it is keeping an eye on when things change. You know, when you start to feel better, challenge yourself a little bit and see if you can decrease your naps. But uh, what I would suggest is you do that by 15 minutes each time over a week. So one week, decrease it by 15 minutes. See how you go when you feel good again. Don't necessarily do 15 minutes one week, 15 minutes the next, 15 minutes the next. That's too quick. Yeah, so it's gradually, slowly seeing what you can cope with. But it's remembering to do that because sometimes things can become a routine. And I know when people, um, I've got some quotes in here later where people were saying, sleeping's lazy. I don't want to sleep. I'm not doing what I need to be doing. Um, and they worry that it's going to become habit forming. Whereas if you try and keep thinking, okay, where am I now and how am I feeling now? Can I try and decrease my daytime naps? Yes or no? And then try and decrease them by 15 minutes. And do it gradually. And that can sometimes help you um, focus back on your nocturnal sleep again. Um, oh, this was the other th sad thing. And as I was reading these and listening to people's stories, um, I found this really sad, actually, that people, in a large number of cases, found that they reached this crisis point where they get caught up in this, I feel great, go down, get stuck down for a few days. People actually started going on this sort of negative trajectory. Um, particularly when they were at that point where they were being pushed back to work or they wanted to go back to work. So we did start seeing this decline and in the interviews um, people were talking about this fact that they actually, it was so hard to accept the fact that they needed to rest, they had to reach this crisis point before they then said, oh, do you know what, I do actually just need to take some time out because this is getting really tough. So, and that happened in, in so many cases, and that's what's really made me think, you know, we really need to be talking about this far more to prevent this happening to anyone else. The other thing was around learning how to rest. So I was talking about the fact that sometimes we think watching TV, reading a book, we're, we're resting. Actually, we're not. Um, and people said, you know, it really took them time to work out what was a good resting activity for them. Um, so this guy was talking about the fact that he sits down and just has a cup of tea. Um, it may turn into a snooze, but he would sit down and have a cup of tea. But then the fact that he, if he did sort of spontaneously fall asleep, he would then sleep for far too long. And so that's why he needed something like an alarm clock or something to, to wake him up so it didn't become too long. Yeah, really useful thing. So even if you're not planning on having a nap, you're just planning on having a cup of tea, set one anyway. Yeah. Because yeah. that can really help. Um, otherwise, you know, you're wide awake and wired at night. Um, and I think he, this was several years later that he'd finally figured out that that's what was happening.
that he was falling asleep without planning to and then sleeping too long. The other thing is, you know, life happens. And sometimes there are events where you do have to stretch yourself. You know, if there's a wedding or something like that where, you know, it's going to be a long day, try and plan around it or allow yourself at least a couple of days to recover from it. You know, you know what's going to come. <laughs> allow yourself to do it. I've talked about this a bit already, the fact that you need to keep actively monitoring what's going on. You know, things don't change all the time. So um, you have to hang in there, unfortunately, because um, things do change. So there's a lovely quote here from a, a lady. You know, you quickly realise that that's not the way I would have reacted usually. And so that told me a lot about letting go, letting other people do things for you. It's important letting go quickly. When people are around and you start to feel tired, you just say, well, that's me. You can stay here if you want, if you're happy, but I'm going to bed. Whereas before, I would never have done something like that. I would have thought, how rude. So she's finally got to this point where she accepts, now I've had enough. I can't do any more. If I do more, I'm going to ruin myself for tomorrow. So she's had to learn to actively say, that's enough for me. You know, unfortunately, I'd love to keep being here. I'd love to stay on. But for me, that's enough. I know my limits now. The trouble is, so this is all good in principle, <laughs> but isn't it hard to away after today and try and put some of this stuff into practice? Um, and I think this lady sums it up really nicely. Um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to keep on at this stuff. You know, he'll sleep for like between nine, night, between nine and nine at night, and he'll sleep during one and five in the afternoon all day, every day. I mean, every day is the same. So that's a lot. So actually, he's only up between 9 and 1 and 5 and 9. So that in itself limits, even if he was feeling, limits his activity time. You know, so she was finding it really hard um, to actively carry on with life because of this need for rest. So it's really hard to actually put this sleeping and napping into practice. And it stopped them doing some things. So people actually needed to start prioritising. You know, OK, the house isn't spotless today. That's all right. That's what we're going to, you know, we're going to prioritise having time together. And sometimes that's what, you know, if, you haven't, if you've only got so much time, it's prioritising it. So what I've done here um, is to list some of the things that people recommended um, in terms of what helped them to manage their sleep and fatigue. Um, so monitoring, they found really, really useful. Um, so they could both see their progress, but also understanding their sleep needs. Um, this idea that you know, when you're at home and you've got a quiet day, it's very easy to scan, uh, plan in rest times or sleep periods. But when you're out, it's really difficult to find somewhere. So trying to think in advance, OK, tomorrow you know, you're going to be somewhere like this. Um, how can you factor in a sleep? Do you want to go to the car? Or you know, If you think about it beforehand, um, it can be really helpful to them when you're there. Remember, oh, yeah, you know, I plan to go and have a half an hour in the car. Um, having prompts about how you want to be prompted to take a rest. Um, people did find over time that they got used to the prompts so they could start reading the signs for themselves. So that then enabled them to be more independent. So it was something that they learned over time. Um, as we mentioned before, setting alarm will feed the daytime naps. They tend to say, um, and we, I don't know how this relates to brain injury, it's actually a study I want to go on to do, but a 40 minute nap, have you heard of the sort of power naps? That's been found to be the time that's been most effective to um, recharge the batteries. Now, I don't know how that relates to brain injury, and obviously that's dependent on sleep needs. Some people may need longer. But um, it is something, you know, if you're sort of thinking, if people sleep longer than that, it can impact on recovery and how people think. Uh, so it's, it's quite useful to have, if you're planning a nap, to do it sort of late morning or early afternoon, because that then means that your body's tired again before night time. Um, so a lot of people have sort of go down after lunch about one o'clock. Um, and, you know, the, the Spanish use that all the time. You know, it's actually part of their routine because that's a good time. The body's sort of already worn out. You've got time to recharge before you then cope with the other half of the day. It's not recommended to sleep after six o'clock because then you've, you've, you've had enough sleep before you try to go to bed at night. So always try and sleep before six or wake up at six. And the other thing to watch out for is caffeine. 